Ram for that kind introduction and very uh, good evening to you all. And it's indeed my pleasure to interact with you all today here in this uh, special platform. So what uh, uh, I'm going to do in next uh, 40, 45 minutes is I'm going to discuss the approach to inborn error of metabolism. So this will be a case scenario based uh, discussion. So uh, what I'm going to discuss is like uh, some of the broad categories of inborn errors and little bit on Indian data. So when to suspect uh, inborn errors, what should be our clinical approach and what should be the approach based on the investigations like including TMS as well as GCMS and other important investigations. And what should be our initial management uh, before we reach the final diagnosis and the specific therapy which is related to specific inborn errors. So first thing is why we should learn. So as a whole, like we used to think inborn error is a rare entity. Uh, for example, if you talk of propionic acidemia, isovaldic acidemia, individually it may be rare, but if you take inborn errors as a whole, it's a not uh, as a group, it's not rare. Almost like it is said that one in 150 to 200 units, they will have at least one inborn error of metabolism. So what should be our aim when, whenever we are learning inborn errors? So first objective is we should not miss an inborn error in which the treatment is available and has got reasonable outcome and which is common and where the prenatal diagnosis can be offered and we can help the family. And please uh, don't think that it is actually only academic interest. So it is not only academic interest, we are helping the baby as well as helping the entire family. So uh, earlier we used to think actually when we were doing my MD as well as DM, so we used to label some rare inborn error of metabolism and that's the end of it. But now actually we have many options like even uh, specific metabolic diets are available and the specific enzyme therapies are available and we can offer prenatal diagnosis. We can help the family in not having a similar kind of uh, dreadly disease in the next pregnancy. So all these things can be done. So why we are missing uh, inborn error of metabolism? So one thing is they give us less time. So within once we start suspecting it, within uh, 24 to 48 hours, many of the inborn errors they deteriorate, and sometimes we may miss the boat even if we even before labeling the diagnosis. And there is significant overlap with the common diagnosis. For example, com what is the most common misdiagnosis? So it is sepsis, isn't it? So many times we think of sepsis, septic shock, these things, and by the time actually uh, we think of inborn error again, we may miss the boat. So conventional literature also, like if you see that uh, routine textbooks, so there can be a lot of biochemical uh, uh, cycles and all these things which uh, puts you off uh, while uh, going through the literature. And now actually like uh, uh, lack of diagnostic facilities, now this is not a problem these days. So this used to be a problem in the earlier days, but now we have a lot of uh, uh, labs which are offering and with relatively lesser cost as compared to the earlier days. So the real challenge is you have to pick up out of a whole lot of, like for example, a whole lot of sepsis cases, a whole lot of other uh, common diagnosis, you have to pick up this inborn error. So this one actually you need to understand, this is called Gerard's hypothesis. So the, it, simply you can understand in this way, for example, B uh, is produced from A and C is the actual product which is produced from B. And for example, this particular enzyme is absent. So from B to C. So what can happen? So there can be three possibilities. One is the product is deficient and the substrate is uh, uh, can getting can become excess or it can lead to a actually uh, metabolism which where actually toxic metabolite can be produced. So you need to uh, think that actually the uh, manifestations of a particular inborn error, actually it can be due to any of these things. In some of the disorders, some of the inborn errors, actually the accumulation of the substrate is the main pathology. So for example, storage disorders, serious cycle defects, these things. Whereas in some of the uh, inborn errors, it is accumulation of the intermediate metabolites like galactosemia, organic aciduria, tyrosinemias, so in these things. 
So in some of the disorders, actually the absence of products like, uh, for example, mitochondrial oxidation defects. So in these things, the uh, product is absent. So the manifestations are predominantly due to that. So he is, uh, Mr. Gerard, considered to be the father of uh, inborn errors. So now what are the broad categories of inborn errors? So you have protein or amino acid metabolism, fatty acid metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism, and other disorders like paroxysomal, miscellaneous like NKH, non-ketotic hyperglycemia, and minkies. So if you look at protein uh, or amino acid metabolism, so you have organic acidemia, cycle defects, and amino acidopathies. So these are the groups. So we'll come to that in a while. And in fatty acid, again, fatty acid oxidation defects. And in carbohydrate metabolism, it is galactosemia, glycogen storage disorders. These are the ones. So a uh, little bit of uh, Indian data. So uh, actually in the literature, I could find uh, this is one of the largest mm -hmm. series. So though it is older one. So from KEM, actually like uh, they have published data of almost 25 years. So more than a thousand inborn errors. So this was the era actually where the diagnosis is used to be difficult. So here, this is the split of these disorders. So 204 two amino acid disorders and 58 organic acidurias like that. And uh, I was going through our unit data in the last uh, three years. So we had around 44 inborn errors in last uh, three years, like leaving uh, the cause like endocrine causes contain adrenal hyperplasia, and those kind of uh, are hypothyroidism, those kind of things. So pure inborn errors. So in which uh, this is the split, amino acidopathy is uh, 14, MSUD 4, like that. And again, uracycle defects around 8, organic acidemia is around 8, galactosemia 4 cases, so like that. So what can be the presentation of inborn error of metabolism? So these are the scenarios where you need to suspect inborn error of metabolism in a new unit. So acute illness following a period of normalcy. So baby is otherwise normal. There is normal perinatal history. There is no risk factor for sepsis. Suddenly on day three, day four, the baby deteriorates. So our sudden deterioration the first one week. Poor feeding and vomiting without any other obvious cause. Baby can present with lethargy or uptendation or neurologically like baby will be encephalopathic. So unexplained tachypnea or deep breathing or acidotic breathing or neurological syndrome like hypotonia or hypertonia seizures, intractable hiccups and cholestatic jaundice is one and unexplained neonatal deaths, history of uh, sudden infant death syndrome, parental consanguinity. So these are the various ways actually the inborn errors can present and uh, you, it should uh, ring alarm in uh, whenever you are handling such cases. In most of these scenarios, actually, like whatever you take, all these things. So often, like if a baby presents to you, like sepsis will be the first concentration most of the time. So now, uh, the broad groups of uh, presentations. So it, uh, like uh, in the earlier slide, we discussed uh, say what are the broad categories, like based on like protein, carbohydrate, as well as lipid. But this, these are the broad groups of presentation in, uh, according to the symptomatology of presentation. So if the baby presents with predominantly neurological syndrome, so acute metabolic encephalopathy or seizures, so you have to think of these are the possibilities. So organic acidemias, uracycle defects, amine acidopathies, non-ketotic hyperglycemia, pyridox-independent seizures. So these are the ones actually which present predominantly with the neurological syndrome. And uh, metabolic acidosis, so these are the ones, organic acidemias, fatty acid oxidation defects, pyruvate oxidation defects like that. Hypoglycemia, so what are the ones which present with hypoglycemia? So galactosemia is one, glycogen storage disorders, fatty acid oxidation defects, organic acidemias. And what are the ones which present predominantly with liver involvement? Jaundice, liver dysfunction, they present with fulminant liver failure. So tyrosinemia is notorious. So galactosemia and glycogen storage disorders can present in this way. So cardiac syndrome. So all of you uh, might have seen at least one case of pompous disorder. So pompous fatty acid oxidation defects. So these are the ones. And sometimes it can be only pure abnormal order or dysmorphism like that. So once uh, 
you come to the individual ones like the neurological syndrome. So often actually like a case of inborn error with the neurological syndrome. So you wrongly label it as a HIE, case of HIE or sepsis with meningitis. So many times actually like uh, uh, this happens in our daily practice because these are common ones and uh, in our uh, routine day-to-day uh, -day scenario, but you should be able to differentiate inborn errors from these common ones. So what can be the clues of inborn errors? So a term baby without any risk factor presenting with neurological syndrome and disproportionate depression in the sensorium. Baby will be deeply encephalopathic. Uptendation will be there. There is no focality in the findings. And waxing and waning sensorium, which means like after starting uh, the baby on NPO and IV fluids, the baby may, baby may improve. Again, once you start the feeding, baby sensorium will dip. So this is uh, one common thing because of the protein load and the rise ammonia levels are uh, toxic metabolites. So this happens. So after starting feeds, baby will deteriorate. And again, after uh, stopping feeds, baby may show partial improvement. So poor response to antibiotic and sometimes uh, no, like the normal CSF and sterile cultures. So in many of these, uh, and uh, we often think actually sepsis screen will differentiate, but in case of inborn errors, actually septic screen also can be misleading because the leukopenia as well as thrombocytopenia are seen in even in organic acidemias also because of the bone marrow suppression. So another uh, common misdiagnosis is like uh, for the if for a baby who is presenting with metabolic acidosis. So if a baby is having metabolic acidosis and acute worsening, so often we think of either septic, sepsis with septic shock or ductus-dependent cardiac lesions. So many times, actually, the ductus-dependent systemic circulation, the ones with uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome or coagulation of aorta, interrupted aortic arch, all these things will have severe hypotension and metabolic acidosis. So what can be the clues uh, here? So what are the pointers for inborn errors uh, in a baby with severe metabolic acidosis? So profound and disproportionate acidosis. So anion, anion gap will be more than 25 and baby will be having mixed, uh, uh, I mean, uh, lactic acidosis as well as ketosis. And uh, there is no or little evidence of hypoperfusion. Baby pulses will be good, but still the baby will be having severe acidosis. And difficult to correct with fluid boluses as well as bicarb. So it won't respond well to either fluid or bicarb. And associated unusual order. So though uh, we say it is rare, actually unusual order also can be a, sometimes a clinching factor. So last month it happened, actually we had a, a baby, like a baby came in the middle of the night. Uh, so initial diagnosis was uh, septic shock. But by the morning when I came to rounds, actually the baby uh, in the room itself, actually the order was so uh, classical that it was like a sweaty feet order and uh, subsequently it turned out to be isovaldic acidemia. So sometimes actually the order also can be a clinching uh, um, factor in the diagnosis. So uh, having discussed these things, so uh, this is one important uh, uh, thing actually which you need to, as a fellows, which you need to uh, understand. Many times actually like we come across with this kind of scenario, baby who is otherwise well suddenly deteriorates in the postnatal uh, period. So in the first one week or second week. So especially when the baby is with the mother or baby will be discharged home after normal delivery, again suddenly deteriorates on day three, day four. So what can be the differential diagnosis? So you can uh, write in your chart box also. So sudden deterioration of a neonate who is otherwise well. Deteriorates in the first one week or second week. So what are the possibilities? Sriram, uh, they can uh, type in the chat box, no? Yeah, yeah, they can. Yeah. Yeah, somebody has uh, written a CAH, CHD, congenital heart disease, PPHN, um, IEM, PDA. For PDA and this thing, actually, there should be a setting hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hyponatremia. 
Yeah, many of the things are possible, but actually, like they will have uh, the predisposing risk factors, are, and there will be a setting for that uh, particular thing. But uh, here, at least these three, four things are very important. Yeah, so IEM, of course, we are discussing. So IEM can uh, have sudden deterioration. So apart from that, ductus dependent cardiac lesions, of course. Uh, so you have two broad categories. So ductus dependent systemic lesions and ductus dependent pulmonary circulation. So where actually both the th both the types they can present on day three or day four whenever the ductus is closing. So the babies with the ductus ductus dependent systemic circulation they will have predominant metabolic acidosis, shock, and poor perfusion. Whereas ductus dependent pulmonary circulation they will have more of hypoxia and cyanosis. And CAH congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Yeah. So these are some of the important things which you should keep in mind. Okay. So whenever there is a sudden deterioration apart from the sepsis and uh, common things. So now whenever you are thinking uh, a baby uh, with inborn error of metabolism, what should be the first line investigation? So before you uh, get the metabolic cut like TMS as well as genetic workup, so what should be the first line investigations? So you can again type in the chart box. So Dr. Satish has mentioned VBG, Bharat, ABG and GRBS, ABG. Yeah, ABG urine electrolytes, ammonia, yeah. Yeah, so um, so what are the first line investigations? So these are the first line investigations which we should do whenever we are thinking of uh, IEM. So blood gas is very important, ammonia, blood sugar, hemogram with differential count, urine or blood ketones, and urine reducing substances. So these are the basic uh, five things actually which you need to do as the preliminary investigation. So because most of them actually you get the report within next uh, 15 minutes to one hour. So blood gas, uh, ammonia, sugar, all these things actually you will get immediately. So whenever you are collecting for ammonia, so you have to collect arterial blood and it has to be collected directly into the tube and place it, uh, it should be placed in ice and it should be processed immediately. So if you delay the processing, so I have seen many labs actually giving the ammonia report after 24 hours or 48 hours. That's uh, like uh, not at all reliable. So once actually there is delay in the processing, what happens is there will be falsely elevated ammonia levels. So this is very important. So you have to collect from artery and it has to be processed within next 15 minutes to 20 minutes. So now once you have the basic uh, investigations, so what should be your initial approach? So you have these set of uh, reports which are available with you. So you, for example, if there is only rise in the ammonia, a significant elevation in the ammonia levels with relatively normal pH and normal bicarb. Or sometimes there can be slight elevation in the pH also. There can be alkalosis, mild alkalosis, especially respiratory alkalosis. So then your diagnosis will be urea cycle defect. Okay. Whereas second group, so where there is rigid ammonia, borderline elevation. So pH is low, bicarb is low. So that means ammonia is high, acidosis is there, metabolic acidosis. So then these are the group of inborn error of metabolism, which you need to think of organic acidemia, fatty acid oxidation defects, and pyruvate dehydrogenase, pyruvate carboxylase, as well as respiratory chain defects. So if both the things are normal, like uh, your initial workup is normal, that means ammonia is fine, there is no acidosis, Still, you are thinking of inborn error. So, what are the possibilities? Again, you can type in chat box. Yeah, somebody has written uh, NKH.
So one is NKH, non-ketotic hyperglycemia. Galactosemia, uh, sometimes actually it will have metabolic ketosis, but there many times it may not have also. And paroxysmal abdominal disorders are, is another classical example where the initial workup can be normal. So now we'll go through an illustrative case. So this particular baby, day three baby, presented to emergency with one day history of uh, poor feeding and vomiting. And there is breathing difficulty for six hours, referred with diagnosis of uh, AS pressure to us. So uh, primary gravida mother, normal delivery, normal perinatal period. So there was consanguinity. So the labor as well as delivery, delivery were unremarkable. And an examination on the baby was examined in ER. So baby was uptended, encephalopathy was present, and tachycardia, tachypnea, and uh, MAP was normal. Baby is hypotonic with sluggish neonatal reflexes. So this is the initial presentation. Okay. So if with this scenario, definitely in you will consider. And these were the initial investigations which were done. So it is showing acidosis, pH 6.95, and bicarb is 7, base excess minus 20, CO2 washout, uh, respiratory alkalosis 18, hypoglycemia, and ammonia is elevated. So uh, what is the definition for hyperammonemia? So whenever the ammonia levels is more than 400, then you call it as hyperammonemia. So usually in case of urea cycle defects, it will be very, very high, sky high, like almost 1500, 2000, like that. So in this case, it is 240. So you have a baby with metabolic acidosis, hypoglycemia, and raised ammonia. So what is the possibility here? So you can type in chat box. Yeah, Dr. Razi has mentioned initial urocycle disorders and again corrected himself, not UCD. Good. So anything else you want to know here? So I didn't mention about like in the initial investigations. I told you a few things, but I didn't mention here one thing here. Yeah, good. So somebody has mentioned a lot ketones. So ketones, if you have, so that will give you a fair idea like what, uh, like what is the group of environments you are dealing with. So this uh, particular baby actually has urine ketones 3 plus and uh, even plasma ketones are also quite high. All of you might be aware like the ketometer, like, just like uh, our glucometer, ketometer also is available and with the cost of around 2000 rupees. And uh, it will give you straight away the value of uh, blood ketones. So this baby had almost like urine ketones 3 plus and plasma ketones for 2 millimoles per liter. So what is the possibility here? So we are dealing with the second group. So let's go through. So this thing I have already discussed. So raised ammonia and metabolic acidosis. So we are discussing with the this group. Again, ketones. Present means, so we'll see. So whenever there is a significant metabolic acidosis, you have to see the plasma and urine ketones as well as lactic acid. So if there is ketosis, so you are dealing with organic acidemias. So here actually, like once you come to the conclusion of organic acidemias, so again, actually you have to look for the skin cutaneous involvement. So in some of the disorders, actually the Cutaneous involvement will be there, like in multiple carboxylase deficiency, biotinidase deficiency, the skin involvement will be there. And uh, without skin involvement, if there is no skin involvement, so these are the differential diagnosis. MMA, propionic acidemia, beta ketothiolase deficiency, isovaldic acidemia. But this is not so specific, like uh, many babies with uh, multiple carboxylase and biotinidase also may not have skin involvement because it will take at least four to five months for these all these manifestations to take place. So in the first one month, actually, the many babies, neonates with multiple carboxylate deficiency may not have skin involvement also. So now coming to the second group, no ketosis. So in this particular case, actually, which I was discussing, so we are dealing with the first group here, ketosis. So most likely possibility is organic acidemia. So without ketosis, 
So in these situations, actually urinal and cytopenias may help. So without ketosis, the diagnosis fatty acid oxidation defects. So if there is actually lactic acidosis, which is significant with or without ketosis, you have to look at the LP ratio, lactate pyruvate ratio. So if the LP ratio is increased, means actually you are dealing with respiratory gene defects or mitochondrial gene defects. So if it is normal, that means actually the elevation, the lactate and the pyruvate are proportionate. So you are dealing with gluconeogenesis or GSD and pyruvate dehydrogen deficiency. So you have to, in this particular group, actually hypoglycemia will be a conspicuous feature. And in this group, ammonia is usually normal. So both in ketosis, like uh, both in organic HDMS as well as fatty acid oxidation defects, urine organic acids will be positive. So whenever you are uh, sending, so the next level of investigation will be once you go th have done the first line investigations, obviously the second uh, investigation will be, uh, next line investigation will be TMS. What is TMS? It is tandem mass spectrometry. So what is the sample that is required? So this is the one, actually the filter paper. So you can do with heel prick. So what is the sample which is preferred? So it is the dried blood spot which is preferred. Okay. And a urine sample is required for GCMS. So it is combination of TMS and GCMS which we send. So GCMS stands for gas chromatography mass spectrometry. So uh, do you prefer cord blood? So cord blood is not preferred. So this is just uh, to illustrate like what are the, not in this particular case, but otherwise like whenever you are uh, planning to send TMS and GCMS, so what are the samples which you can send? So urine as well as dried blood spot uh, are the ideal ones. And cord blood actually is not preferred because usually in most of these disorders, it will take at least two to three days for the, uh, in the postnatal period for the toxic metabolites to increase in the blood. So cord blood will have falsely normal values. So what about venous blood? Can you prefer venous blood? In most of the scenarios, actually, yes. So you can take from venous blood. But sometimes actually what can happen is like if the baby is already on TPN. So uh, if you take from venous blood, so many times there will be false elevation of many of the amino acids. So in filter paper test, what they, uh, we will do is so four to five circle of blood of one centimeter, they are collected on the filter paper and it's dried up. So, and once it is sent to the lab, so what they will do? So they will uh, actually like, they will make small circles of three millimeters of blood soaked filter paper, they will be punched out and their metabolites will be extracted with organic solvents. So usually it will analyze almost like uh, within two minutes, um, 15 to 30 analytes. So uh, that's why actually you need to also understand that it is a screening procedure. TMS is a screening procedure which is designed to handle large number of samples. So as uh, part of newborn screening. So the some of the simple rules like practical points whenever you are sending TMS is take adequate size three to four blood spots, take at least two filter papers and allow to dry properly before mailing it. And uh, uh, this is the principle. So as uh, the name says, tandem mass spectrometry, which means there are two spectrometers, mass spectrometers, which are there in tandem. So in sequence. So uh, this is the first one. So this is the uh, first one. And initially there will be separation of molecular ions. And from there, actually, there will be fragmentation of uh, molecular ions. And from there, it will go to uh, here. So into the second spectrometer. So where there will be again fragmentation of these ions and it will be detected with a detector. So that is the basic principle of uh, uh, TMS. So any abnormal result in TMS, it should be subjected to the confirmatory test like the GCMS. So what, are, what can be the problems in TMS? So many times it can be false positive also, as I was mentioning if the baby is already on TPN. So it can give false positive result. Sometimes it can be false negative. So if it is a milder clinical course, so or if you give some treatment again after that, if you take the sample, so after you correct the acidosis, you give some cocktail therapy and you take the sample. So again, there can be falsely normal values, and it can be due to some sampling errors. 
So these are all the ones actually like uh, TMS, you know, uh, most of you know the how the report will look like. And for these disorders also like uh, the TMS is being developed. So in the you have different panels of uh, TMS, like if you uh, uh, meet the lab people, actually they will give so many panels. So starting from bas basic panel, FS, FS plus, or in different labs, actually they, there's different uh, nomenclature, but this is the basic panel. So uh, which includes the seven disorders, hypothyroidism, CAH, G6PD, cystic fibrosis, galactosemia, biotinidase deficiency, and PK, euphenyl ketonuria. So these are the seven disorders and this is the basic panel. So over and above you have actually like extended panels also. So uh, where you will get the, uh, like for different costs. So for example, basic panel usually costs around thousand rupees. And if you go for extended panels, it will cost anywhere between 3,000 to 5,000 rupees. So uh, including GM, GCMS, it will cost some 5,000 to 6,000 rupees like that. So in this particular case, actually now uh, coming back to our original case. So what happened was, so in this baby, actually the TMS was not so conclusive. So here they have given actually the C6 hydroxy metabolites are elevated. They are above the normal and the differential diagnosis can be any of all these things. So in the next, we, uh, by the time next uh, day, we got the GCMS report again, which is showing all elevation of these uh, metabolites in the urine. So we got the possibility of either biotrendase versus uh, multiple carboxylate deficiency or three MCC deficiency. So methyl crotonyl uh, carboxylate deficiency. So we have sent the biotrendase uh, levels in this baby. So which is very low. Again, we have confirmed with uh, another lab. And this is the genetic report. So this, which is showing mutation of the homozygous nonsense mutation of the BTD gene. So this is the prof diagnosis, profound biotrendase and multiple carboxylate deficiency. So actually this baby initially because of the organic acidemia rise, uh, like severe acidosis, so we have done uh, many things like uh, this baby uh, baby required ventilation, supportive care, inotropes, even um, uh, metabolic cocktail. But once the report came, so we uh, continued biotin and we stopped rest all medications. So this is a case to the similar kind of presentation with similar initial values. So, so in this baby, actually the initial TMS report has shown possibility of propionic acidemia or methyl melanonic acidemia. And uh, subsequent genetic report came as like uh, methyl melanonic acidemia, MMA B gene mutation, homozygous mutation. So basically, it is two cases of organic acidemias we have seen. So how do organic acidemias present? So they present with acidosis, rigid ammonia, ketosis, hypoglycemia, and negative ferric chloride test, and bone marrow suppression, and secondary carnitine deficiency. So these are the things so actually you have to keep in mind whenever you are handling a case of organic acidemia. So what is the initial management like before getting the final uh, uh, diagnosis in the organic acidemia? So it is basically defect in the catabolism of branched chain amino acids. So these are all the five uh, types, like uh, five disorders in organic acidemia. So initially, like whenever you are handling such case, start IV glucose at eight mg per case per minute, maintain hydration and go up on dextrose Stop feeding, you can give IV lipid, don't give protein, don't start amino acids, and give vitamin B12 actually, and biotin higher dose up to uh, 20 milligrams per day, carnitine because of secondary carnitine deficiency, and liberal bicarbonate therapy, and dialysis will help. So the previous baby which I was mentioning actually underwent dialysis before we got the final diagnosis. So this biotinoid deficiency, which I was mentioning, the skin manifestations, hypotonia. So it will take some time for these things to manifest. So usually if the baby presents it in the fourth month as a four to six months of age, you will get all these findings. So now uh, let's move on to the second uh, case scenario. So uh, here I need your active uh, inputs. So this is again a 36 weeker, 2.3 kg, four days baby. Brought to emergency with overnight history of lethargy and unresponsiveness. 
and babies uh, like initial labor and delivery were unremarkable and because of it's a normal delivery uh, baby was discharged on day one itself and during the last trimester mother had anemia jaundice and thrombocytopenia and there is history of previous baby brought to emergency with sudden respiratory arrest and cause label was sids sids so what can be the possibility what, what are your thoughts you can type in chat box so somebody mentioned the hypoglycemia third degree heart block organic anemia So SIDS, uh, long QT syndrome can have, uh, uh, can present like SIDS, but uh, we are discussing about inborn errors. Yeah, any more uh, thoughts? I have given you two important clues here. So as you last two points, during last trimester, mother had uh, certain things. Previous baby presenting with seeds. Yeah, any more thoughts? So somebody is mentioning uh, torch infections, torch. <clears throat> Yeah, on examination, this baby is uh, comatose and uh, heart rate is 170, tachycardia, tachypnea is there, hepatomegaly is there, and hypotonic with sluggish neonatal reflexes. Any guesses? So let's uh, see. So uh, what is this case? So this baby had severe metabolic acidosis. So 7.1 bicarb low, base axis minus 18, hypoglycemia, raised ammonia and ketones negative. So what is the diagnosis now? What are the group of disorders we are dealing with? Yeah, somebody has mentioned the fatty acid oxidation defects, FAO. Yeah, good. So we are mainly dealing with second group, like in that uh, initial approach which I have mentioned. So again, if you have metabolic acidosis with ketosis and without ketosis. So we are dealing with fatty acid oxidation disorders here. So uh, what were the uh, clues which I have given in the previous slide? So last trimester, mother had these things. Actually, interestingly, the, if the baby has fatty acid oxidation defects, actually mother can present like help-like syndrome in the last trimester. So that is one important clue. And apart from many other disorders which are associated with SIDS, Fatty acid oxidation defects, especially um, MCAT deficiency. So it is associated with SIDS. Yeah. So fatty acid oxidation defects, like they present with hypoglycemia, raised ammonia, no ketosis, transaminitis. So these are the three varieties, short chain, medium chain, and long chain. Uh, sl coa dehydrogenase deficiency. Most common is MCAD. So if you look at all cases of SIDS, so almost 2 to 3 percent of seed deaths are uh, as a result of MCAD. So presentation can be help in mother. In neonates, it will present like uh, vomit, vomiting, lethargy, even seizures, and rapid progression to coma. And in infant, so some of them, they will have actually late onset uh, presentation also. So they can have episodic illness. So they can have presentation anywhere between 6 months to 2 years. And long chain, like uh, very long chain, uh, SL coa dehydrogenase deficiency, it will present as cardiomyopathy. So, what are the principles of treatment? You have to provide high dextrose, avoid fasting. So, you should not keep the baby NPO here. Okay. And treat with carnitine. So, give carnitine higher dose and low fat diet. So, let's go through another case scenario. Baby born at 37 weeks by repeat C section. Normal Apgars, first day feeding well, and baby at the end of 48 hours developed poor feeding and vomiting. And now hypotonic, lethargic, and deep breathing, baby has hypothermia. 
so this is the blood gas mild alkalosis CO2 26, normal bicarb, ammonia 1500, septic workup normal. So what is the differential diagnosis here? What is the possibility? So you are dealing with, yeah, yeah as you are mentioning, it is urocycle defects. So uh, urocycle defect will have this kind of presentation and initial workup will be like that. So normal uh, blood gas or uh, I mean, uh, are mild alkalosis with very high ammonia levels. So again, actually, like if you look at the overall group of um, uh, raised ammonia, so uh, if the baby is presenting in the first 24 hours and the baby is a premature baby, there is an entity called TAN, transient hyperammonemia of the newborn. So, and the second group, like after uh, 24 hours presentation without acidosis, so you are mainly dealing with urea cycle defects. And subsequent classification, like whether it's acetylenemia or arginosexenic acidemia, so all these things, they are based on elevation of citrin, elevation, uh, normal or abnormal citrulline levels. So what are the principles of management here? You have to promote ammonia excretion so, uh, and minimize catabolism and stop protein intake. So give adequate fluids, electrolytes, give 10% dextrose, at a higher dextrose infusion rate, 8, 10 mg per case per minute. Give lipids and sodium benzoate, sodium phenyl acetate, and uh, arginine hydrochloride. So these are the main three things in the management. So there is an injection called Ammonal also, which is now available in the market. And you have to consider peritone dialysis or deviate if the ammonia is exchange if the ammonia is very high. So lactose sometimes it will help in reduction of ammonia levels. So that is uh, the management of urea cycle defects, initial management. So now actually we have discussed different kinds of presentation and different uh, clinical syndromes of presentation till now. So let's go through relatively uncommon inborn errors also. So for example, uh, like a baby having dysmorphism. So as I was mentioning in the initial slide, so some of the inborn errors they can present with dysmorphism. So like, uh, so we'll uh, go through this scenario. So what is this baby having? So this baby is having somewhat Down's kind of picture, isn't it? So these are the abnormal things which this baby is having. High forehead, hypoplastic supraorbital ridge, epicanthal folds, broad root of nose, redundant neck folds, and hypotonia. So uh, the diagnosis is Gelweger syndrome. So a, a inborn error which will have Down's kind of phenotype is Gelweger syndrome. So what are the other inborn errors which can present with dysmorphism? So lysosomal storage disorders, they can present with dysmorphism. So this Gelweger's, they can have other clinical features like cataracts, carnal clouding, heptomegaly, cystic disease of kidney and these things. So it can also have patellar calcifications and also pachyg area in the brain. So these are some of the manifestations of gel vagus. So this uh, baby we had uh, recently, uh, um, three months back. So baby uh, seizures very onset, actually like very early onset, this baby had seizures right from uh, birth actually in the first one hour of life only. And... Um, uh, this baby turned out to be pyridox independent seizures. So actually like uh, in pyridox independent seizures, uh, even in utero seizures are also described. Okay, this uh, particular baby, day, this is the day three video. So as you can see in the video, the baby had very like uh, subtle seizures initially. And baby was not responding to all the anticonvulsion, even phenobarb, higher dose, uh, levetiracetam, as well as phosphenatoin. So subsequently, like after loading, and we have done uh, EEG, and uh, uh, while the baby is getting EEG, we have given pyridoxin. So uh, at the time, baby responded easy also is improved. And subsequently, this baby turned out to be genetically also, um, there was abnormal mutation suggestive of pyridox independent seizures. 
so there is actually here uh, it is important for fellows to know that actually there is a thing called paradox in dependent seizures and paradox in responsive seizures so what is the difference so pyridoxine response to seizures means actually like whatever may be the etiology, if you give higher dose of pyridoxine, they may respond transiently. But again, they will recur and usually it, the short lasting response will be there. Whereas pyridoxine dependent seizure is basically a genetic mutation. Uh, so these babies will require lifelong pyridoxine and relatively low dose of pyridoxine. So this is another uh, uh, neonate with uh, seizures. A day six baby came to us, uh, male, normal uh, blood gas, normal ammonia, and uh, RBS and ketones. So we are discuss dealing with the third group. So what can be the possibility? So this is the baby. This baby had seizures, hypotonia, irregular respiratory effect, uh, efforts in between, and hiccups. So possibility. What can be the diagnosis here? Yeah. So as somebody is mentioning uh, NKH, yes, and it's uh, non-ketotic hyperglycemia. So we have done uh, like blood glycine levels, CSF glycine levels. So the CSF glycine actually significantly elevated and the ratio is also significantly elevated. If the ratio is more than 0 0.08, then you call it as hyperglycine that is consistent with NKH. So uh, these are some downloaded pics. So th this baby, uh, what can be the disorder? It is Minkis disease. So baby will have brittle hair. So uh, the baby will be having hypotonia, hypothermia, intractable seizures. So the poor progress is very poor. And there's treatment which is available, copper histidine. So this is another baby with inborn error. So you have hypotonic baby with cardiomegaly. So the diagnosis is pompous disease. And in pompous, you will have large voltage complexes in the ECG, in the precardial leads. So now uh, coming to the last few slides. So these are the abnormal urine orders. So initially, like when I was uh, in my MD, I used to think actually this abnormal urine order is only of academic uh, interest. But after going uh, through three, four uh, cases of isovaltric casedemia and MSUD, so I realized that like this is very characteristic feature and once you get that case, you won't forget. So you can uh, get them in the books. So, yeah. So sometimes actually like this scenario, you will come across. So previous baby with confirmed inborn error, now the baby is born. So what will you do now? So we know that actually many of them are autosomal recessive disorders and 25% uh, recurrence risk is there. So if the prenatal genetic work is not done, so this is how you have to go about. So start IV dextrose for the initial 24 hours and perform the baseline workup. So those five things which I was mentioning. And first you have to add MCT, medium chain triglycerides, but uh, uh, you should not add them in fatty acid oxidation defects if the previous baby has FEO. And repeat the investigations after 48 hours. Then gen start. Uh, you add low protein milk, and again repeat after 48 hours. And if negative, follow up with the normal diet. So that is how you do whenever you are dealing with a uh, case where the previous baby is affected with confirmed IEM. So this is uh, like uh, a role of vitamins in inborn errors. So you know that actually thiamine is useful for MSUD and PDH deficiency, riboflavin for, for regulatory acidemias, pyridoxine for homocystinuria, and vitamin C for tyrosinemia. And for mitochondrial disorders, you have to give mitochondrial cocktail. So in which CoQ as well as uh, riboflavin, higher dose carnitine and uh, vitamin E, all those things you have to give. So these things are uh, really helpful in many of these disorders. And by the time, like till the time you get the final diagnosis. So these things actually will tide over the crisis and you can save the baby. And uh, megavitamin therapy. So if you uh, don't know the diagnosis, 
so it's a metabolic cocktail actually which you give so which contains all these things uh, in higher doses so thiamine riboflavin and uh, b3 pyridoxine biotin and these things so uh, coming to the specific diets principles so uh, in most of these disorders actually the carbohydrates can be given liberally and vitamins minerals and trace elements they can be given and whenever you are uh, uh, dealing with a case prepare the list of foods which can be given liberally and restrict the amount like what are the things which need to be uh, restricted what are the things which need to be completely avoided so that list you need to give to the parents so these are some of the basic principles urocycle deficits restrict the protein in galactosemia like galactose free diet organic acidemias and msud you have to restrict branched chain amino acids and in pku phenyl alanine restricted diet like that you will give so now uh, specific diets are available um, by many companies so, so these are the ones which so we use commonly so available from bangalore and uh, even other brands like they provide uh, specific diets for many of these disorders so whenever actually like uh, uh, you come across a situation where the baby comes to you in a terminal stage so there is a and uh, baby expired and you couldn't send the initial workup so there is a thing called biochemical autopsy and this used to be more popular one uh, uh, around uh, 10 years back but now with the availability of uh, genetic investigations so if you collect the blood and urine sample these are enough so yes, if you can collect skin biopsy and liver biopsy so they will be definitely helpful in uh, arriving the final diagnosis so this is just another simple uh, scenario uh, to mention that actually many of the inborn errors so they can have late onset variants also so all the inborn errors uh, they won't present in the neonatal period itself so we uh, recently we came across 11 months old boy uh, where actually like the baby presented with uh, simple uh, ji illness followed by altered sensorium and uh, on history actually like uh, when we asked there is delay in the motor milestones and uh, whenever there is any acute episode of worsening the baby used to lose some of the milestones so subsequently like the work up was done so this was consistent with organic acidemias and this baby turned out to be uh, propionic acidemia so uh, late onset presentation is also known in, in many of the inborn errors so in milder variants so if uh, whenever there is any unexplained mental retardation developmental delay or regression or episodic illness so you have to think of so late onset variants of inborn errors so these are some of the classical examples where actually you have late onset variants yeah uh, these are the ones with the episodic decompensation urea cycle defects mitochondrial fatty acid oxidation defects so now coming to the type of inheritance so autosomal recessive is the most common isn't it so you have certain x linked uh, inheritance also like uh, arnithin transcarbamylase deficiency in urea cycle defects peroxisomal again x linked minkis again x linked dominant so you have a thing called mitochondrial inheritance so for all mitochondrial disorders so this slide is very important like what are the among all the inborn errors which we were discussing till now so what are the ones with good outcomes what are the ones with average outcomes because actually like you can't afford to miss these diagnoses so galactosemia is like uh, the outcome is very good biotinidase deficiency again outcome is very good pku if you diagnose it very early the outcome is very good pyridoxine dependent seizures again outcome is very good so average outcomes like uh, uh, these are the ones time and responsive msud and mild urea cycle defects and beta 2 responsive methylmalonic acid i think uh, this is the last uh, slide so one word about uh, genetic testing so till now we discussed actually different work up tms gcms baseline investigations but these days actually in the current era if you don't do genetics so your workup is incomplete so always like you should uh, do genetic workup also that will that is the one actually which is going to help the family the most so it's not your uh, label of diagnosis alone so just a, uh, like in most of the disorders actually it is a point mutation so you need to 
have either specific like uh, mutation analysis for that particular gene or whole exome sequencing. So just to have a glimpse of uh, this genetic test. So if you want to pick up the chromosomal number or the large changes in the chromosome, you will order for karyotyping, isn't it? And if you want to know the specific chromosome, whether it's present or not, for example, presume 21 or uh, 13, 18, or Cryduchart syndrome. So these kind of things actually you can order for Fisher QF-PCR. And if you want to know the small deletions and duplications, order microarray. And if you want to know the single gene disorders, like single uh, nucleotide changes, you have to order for either single gene mutation analysis or Sanger sequencing or whole exome sequencing. So though like uh, the current uh, session is not for genetics, so probably I think we can learn in some other session, but what I'm trying to tell is like without a genetic analysis, your workup is incomplete. So the complete workup of inborn error includes once you suspect inborn error, do proper screening investigations like TMS and other baseline investigations, confirm the diagnosis with your GCMS and other things and get the genetic diagnosis done and start the special diet or specific treatment, if any. And you have to offer the family regarding the prenatal diagnosis and genetic counseling has to be done. So then only like it is the complete workup of a case of inborn error. So thank you very much and thank you very much for your time. I thank IAP Neochap uh, for uh, giving me this wonderful opportunity. And uh, over to you, Sri Ram. Yeah, that was a nice discussion. So any doubts? Anyone have any queries to ask? I think you have given uh, very nice examples that covered almost all the most of the inborn errors have been covered, which are commonly encountered. And what are the clues for those diagnoses? I think all of these have been covered nicely. Um, yeah, I think if there are none, we will wind up. Uh, thank you, Sunil, for your very wonderful presentation and thank you for accepting the invitation. Uh, thank thank you. you. It was a very nice discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. What, metabolic cocktail doses. Metabolic yeah, uh, I have mentioned that. Just uh, I'll again show you. So, yeah, so see, so in mega vitamin therapy, so these are the doses, metabolic cocktail doses. So, in mitochondrial cocktail, again, you have uh, again uh, separate set of doses for uh, many of these things. So, it is again combination of. Uh, as I was mentioning, CoQ, B2, carnitine, uh, and uh, EVN, and uh, all those things. But in the mega vitamin therapy or uh, metabolic cocktail, so these are the doses. Yeah, before sending TMS, we should do the basic investigation. Of course, uh, because the basic investigation means it is a blood gas uh, and ammonia and um, uh, your basic investiga urine investigations as well as the blood sugar levels so and ketones. Yeah, like so ketones these reports will be available within one hour, isn't it? So then only like uh, you can uh, uh, go like which uh, in one error you are uh, dealing with. You can uh, decide and you can start the initial management also because the TMS is going to take at least uh, three to five days depending from lab to lab and place to place. And once you uh, suspect actually you have to, you can always start the vitamin therapy also immediately within the first few hours. Metabolic cocktail you can start and many of the uh, drugs you can start. So your initial basic uh, or baseline investigations are very important. I think there are no more queries, so we can wind up. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I think this presentation will be available in the YouTube, so you can revisit it. So yeah, it will be there and available in the YouTube, IAP Neochap uh, channel. So you can visit that.
please go through the presentation once again it was very informative so it is a ready reckoner for you for the iems you can go through the approaches the case scenarios so all these things uh, dr sai sunil has mentioned so please go through it once again and uh, one thing which he has also mentioned that nowadays the formulas are also available in our country the especially as told you about pristine organics so that is that also you can keep in mind uh, so that also you can look into it it is iap new chap channel youtube channel yeah pristine labs bangalore okay so that is uh, one company which provides